Stephen Feldsman, who has been our poet in residence at the Pedagogische Hochschule for, for a number of years, and I have known him since uh, nine, since uh, you know, since uh, 2009, I think for nine years now, when he began teaching here in the Oila department and then later in the English department, teaching poetry, literature, writing, language courses, and research. And in addition, he is uh, active on the film board of Karlsruhe. Uh, one film called Sugar uh, was shown at the Kerbal three years ago, uh, and he has also worked on the documentary on racism. Um, so in the past, in addition to being uh, a widely published poet, and has been nominated for the Pushcart Award in 2012. Um, he has edited a magazine in New York State, and he has worked in the film and television industry in California. He has written scripts for both films and television, including a television program called Yesterdays, recommended by the Board of Education. And in Germany, he, he founded and taught and ran a language school in Halle for many years. So his recent uh, full-length book publications um, are Like Water to Stone, which came out with Adelaide Press in uh, last year, in October 2017. American Voices by Outlaws, which came out in December of last year. And most recently, Where the Leaves Darken, just now, this month, um, and also by Adelaide Press. And tonight he'll be reading from all three books, and he'll be available for signings in the break as well as after um, the reading. So, welcome, Stephen Pelsman. Can you hear me okay? Is it too loud? All right. So first, um, as always, there are tons of people. You'd be surprised as to the effort and the time and the work that goes into putting an event, even an event like this, together. So I've got a ton of people I'd like to thank. <clears throat> first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Shipley for her uh, kind introduction. Um, and I also have to publicly thank Dr. Shipley for all of the conversations that we've had over the years. She's been a literary lifesaver in that regard, and it's highly appreciated. There are a few people um, that I'd also like to thank, including all of you, by the way. <clears throat> but I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Schwab for being here. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Ludwig for providing additional assistance in making this happen. And you see there's a film crew and Yelena as far as books. Um, Siri? I've got students from a number of different colleges over at the DH, here at the PH, at the Bundeswehr Fachhochschule. And some of my soldier friends are here with us this evening as well. And I'd like to thank um, Herr Ewald, the English Department Secretary, Frau Knorr, um, Helen, the uh, SIM crew. Lots of people have really made an effort to try to put this together. And for keeping my students hostage and coming to a poetry reading on a Monday evening, I'd like to thank them as well. So. You know, it's an interesting thing. I've got tons of notes here, and I probably will not read anything in the notes and just do it spontaneously. 
surprisingly, the single one thing that someone asks you when they discover that you're a writer is, what do you write about? And when you write poetry, they seem to not understand the answer, everything. Because that's really what you do. You literally write about everything. The way a person sits, the way a person moves, a bird falling from a tree, a war scene, a person dying, a child walking in that crooked, funny, silly way, stretching out a mother's arm down the sidewalk. You literally write about everything your thoughts, your feelings, your imagination works over time. And you pretty much <clears throat> see the windows of people's lives and sometimes their souls. So my work consists of stories and people and events about everything. I'm going to start with um, and I'm going to give you some background information as well. As you can see, I'm not on the younger side. So I was born in New York. And in the summers uh, in New York in the 1950s and 1960s, people used to go out of the city. And some of you might recall the film Dirty Dancing by any chance. OK. Well, that actually happened. I know because I lived it. Um, those hotels and those bungalow colonies were in upstate New York. And my family would go upstate New York into these bungalow colonies, and we'd stay for the summer to get out of the heat and the humidity of New York City. Most of my poems are stories that are real, either first or second hand. And this first poem actually took place, and it's titled, a bat invades our summer bungalow. But I must tell you something rather interesting. <clears throat> it was part of the first book, Like Water to Stone. And the book had gone to many publishers. And I had the book accepted by a few publishers. But one publisher had three editors deciding on whether they would take the book or not. And one of the editors sent me a letter that said, you know, I really like bats. If you change the story of the bat and make it a positive hero rather than negative, we'll publish your book. It's a tough business. A bat invades our summer bungalow. In late August, when deer feel it is safe to wander across Sullivan Road, and black bears sniff out the last ripe berries before September's chill. My mother airs out the bungalow of stifling heat and wilted roses, first planted many summers ago. She leaves open a window and puts us to sleep to the aroma of cold pine bark and moss dripping wet in the moonlight. When it enters like a sudden awakening, to a nightmare and tumbles deep into itself, a silhouette collecting darkness as a wound discolors skin to blanket the room with its wings. Its madness drives my mother mad, with her one hand on top of her hair in a bun, while the other holds a broom as the moon eavesdrops against the wooden walls and the sky thins into a faded blue. But this flying leech does not fly. And that's the thing that scares her most. As she watches it spread out its body like a lost continent on a map of white and yellow plastered walls, with its tiny eyes bulging and gritty teeth fangs wider than the kitchen lamplight, beaming lighthouse signals to sea creatures on the horizon. She turns on all the lights and locks us in the bedroom while she chases this sticky chunk of flesh, its heart beating against one wall, then leaping to another, turning my mother into a housewife Don Quixote with a broom muttering words like a lost tongue only she and it would understand. 
They danced this way in the cold summer air. She afraid it would nest in her hair, and it afraid the stars would not show the way to the endless darkness it longed for. It's true. The funniest thing being in a locked room with my sister screaming and me banging at the door and my mother having a broom chasing this bat flying from wall to wall, hilarious. <laughs> Unless the bat gets stuck in your hair, then it's not so funny. <clears throat> there are poems that I have written <coughs> which Sometimes you look at someone, and you've all actually lived this, you look at someone's face and at someone's body and you can literally read their history. It's like, a, as the expression goes, a window into a person's soul. And I've got a few poems that pretty much talk about certain people that made me feel, feel this way. This took place in Portugal, again true. And I was driving through Portugal, then into Spain, then a ferry over to Morocco, and a bus from the port, I guess that's Tangier, to uh, Marrakesh. While in Portugal, we were walking some country roads, of course, looking for a Roman site, an archaeological site. And we hooked up with a gentleman by the name of Miguel and Miguel became our guide. So this is titled, A Walk with Miguel. Miguel tells us that what is buried here stays here under the Portuguese sun. As he fans himself with the straw hat, he swings by his side. And that when we see petals fall and the last bees hover as awkward heads of raw green skin suddenly appear, that is when apples bud and dangle like unwanted words and then blossom tilting this way and that. This, he tells us, means that spring has arrived. As the newborn sunlight leans against the slope above a small stream flowing through the valley where cork oak trees and open woodlands are warm to the touch in the sheer wind passing as nearby sheep graze and Iberian pigs thrive on the fallen acorns. Miguel's hobbled walk is steady, like an old horse put out to pasture. And against the blinding sunlight, he is more scarecrow, scarecrow than man. But we keep up, stride for stride, past the slanted hillside, fincas and eucalyptus ready for the harvest, and the olives recently picked the marks of nets dried in the ground where the shaken olives had fallen and are kept beside the stone walls and barrels. Miguel says it is better to be here now rather than in the dry heat of summer when crickets sing and the vines are weighted down by fruit and when buses full of tourists roam the old mosaic floors entombed in foundations lived over for thousands of years, he says, antiquity, like all else, is best kept in the dark. He is an old man who is careful with his smile and as careful at picking bones from sardines and tipping his hat to old women passing on their way to market. He has lived here forever. He says, as do his ten grandchildren, he reminds us when he extends his hand for the coins and dollars we lay flat on his tan palm. And as we head back to the parked car beside the cafe, with a shiny apple and green olives still full of grass we had taken from the fields, Miguel is approaching another couple, talking aloud of Roman ruins, of hillsides, full of olives and sheep, of acorns and the smell of spring, of how an old man with ten grandchildren knows the secrets of old Rome. And he did. He would tell us often um, how he knows everything about the Roman Empire. 
about the fields full of apples. And I did walk up a road with apple orchards. And one farmer actually threw an apple to me while I was walking up this dirt path. Hey. Hi, guys. So um, quite often, you write a story because of a real event that takes place that doesn't include you. And in Florida, uh, about two or three years ago, some neighbors <clears throat> by this ocean town, um, Key Largo, which any of you, if you know anything about Humphrey Bogart and old films, you'd know the film title, Key Largo. Three utility workers were called because they smelled what we would refer to as rotten eggs. And this is exactly what happened. Key Largo. One by one, three utility workers descended into a manhole. One by one, they died. On Long Key Road, the smell of rotten eggs drew three utility workers to an endless truth. Without veering from the tropical sunlight, surrounded by woody shrubs and hardwood trees, they followed their shadows, familiar to the patterns of one another, each stride as correct as the next, each habit repeated in an understood silence, having measured their distance before, understanding the animal twitches and the trust they shared and the relief each one depended on. They followed the music of who they are. When they removed a manhole cover, breathed in the decomposed vegetation and descended into the earth in the same soldierly manner whenever they had found themselves in danger, no matter the season, the sun falls beyond the horizon, anointing each wave before it slips out of sight, leaving its memory to linger, as men do to carry on after they are gone. This began thousands of years ago in an eternal image of each man rising on willing to fall, learning to be a man, learning to love something bigger and distinguish themselves to survive. There is nothing subtle in this. Yet they feel the warmth of each stoic stare and sculptured grin on the hot pavement of a neighborhood by the sea. One man opens the passageway to the earth's underbelly and like every man before him, I have seen once a man landing on the moon, a miner stalking the earth with a pick and shovel, a soldier's hastily built foxhole to sink in the depth's darkness. What else was he to do but to lower himself into the unknown? So one by one, after the silence of one man, another descended only to share the same secret of eternity and be overcome by poisonous fumes that lie beneath Monroe County, a hole below just wide enough to fit a man's body, was filled with hydrogen sulfide and methane gas created from years of rotted vegetation. A little town like any other by the sea where once I heard a thousand sounds drowned out by the silence of the sun. So that happened. Three utility workers opened up a manhole cover. One descended, silence. The second had no choice. My soldier friends know you don't fight for politics. You don't fight for philosophy. You fight for the man next to you. The second one descended, silence. The third man, fear must have been there. He went down anyway. They all died. So let me move on to something that I experienced in Madeira, the island of Madeira, 
Have any of you been to Madeira? On a soldier's salary? Shame on you. <laughs> it's a lovely island. It truly is. But sometimes, and this was one of them, where I looked into the face of an old man sitting on a chair, and I swear I could have read you his entire life's history. This is titled, Sweet Madeira. Jose's bony fingers and head shake as he hums and swip, sips sweet Madeira wine while sitting in the shade of banana trees stiffened against the humid air, still green, late in the season. But the little glass leaves a syrupy ring, which he pokes his pinky in, smiles at the dog beneath his feet, and swirls the remaining wine around his fingers and sighs. The season is almost over, Nino. He mutters to the dog, named after his dead son, all he has left of a life spent on the sea, fishing for scabbard and tuna, drinking with the old men and washing, washing down the rusty bolts as old as he. His fingers are good for nothing other than counting the years and the many times the cable cars slice through the blue air to rise and drift to the high hills above where his wife and daughter and sun lie, tucked away in a family patch of dry earth beside the aroma of sweet levatas and cat piss and under the circling buzzards and encroaching thick clouds. In another life, he might have been a pirate hugging the coast and jagged cliffs, listening for the sounds of green canaries and seagulls resisting the wind or rummaging through the leafy laurels stretched across the mountain slopes where the air may have contained sugarcane and sweet salt or the dry blood of African slaves and musket power, powder for the killing that always comes with conquering. Jacaranda and coral line the alleyways and volcanic hills and the old wrinkled women sit on the hot pavement peddling their handmade shawls and sweaters, their tho throats too dry to bark, their eyes too tired to cry, their children too distant to care, their husbands too dead to make a difference. Jose understands that his life is measured in the long toss of fishing line glowing silvery in the moonlight and that one day soon he will sleep among the lavadas that carry water and life across the island, leaving his dark shadow to roam against the sea and sing quiet songs to itself. So, it's a beautiful island, but just like all of us as we walk down a street in Karlsruhe and we see a person perhaps begging for money, we walk by. We know the person is there. If we look and take a moment to study their face, you can feel and see the pain. But we ignore it because maybe it's too painful. I don't have that choice. I'm a writer. A painter doesn't have that choice. A photographer doesn't have that choice. We have to get it down on paper or on film or on canvas. It's just what we have to do. A friend of mine, Daniel, who is not able to be here this evening, <clears throat> one day about two years ago, was sitting down and telling me about his mother. And I'd like to share with you that sometimes what might seem heavy, actually there are hidden coded messages of hope. Sometimes acceptance is about hope. Sometimes understanding is about hope. Daniel was trying to explain to me why his mother never loved him, or so he thought and felt, and she was dying. And he shared some private moments, and they stayed with me. And I wrote a poem titled, He Needed to Know. 
All of these have been published individually. He needed to know for Daniel. She had refused to lie still and speechless, having promised her children that death need not be boring and sad. But the tubes and morphine weighed heavily against her moist pajama, and her son would not let her go. They shared the same dark room and smelled the medicine and counted breaths together, taking them back to when they had both been young. And he remembered how to be patient without the frustration he had often shown as a small boy trying to understand why his mother had not loved him. The cool early spring at the lake where they lived jabbed at her like doctors and the forlorn words they used when they took her off chemo that her body rejected. So they sent her home to gaze at waves whose purpose is only to reach the shore and retract within themselves. This summer, he will sit alone, counting the white sails skirting beneath the moon's crest, the sun burning the edges of sky until its face turns pale and relaxes its muscles into a fragile darkness. This summer, he will sit alone at the shore and recall how she had taught him to swim and dive and to hold his breath under water and how his sudden absence beneath the rippled waves had not changed the warmth of the sun. Back to um, the Catskill Mountains again, upstate New York. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. My mother turned 90 years old um, f two weeks ago. And sometimes you remember your mother or your father when they were young. Of course, you were young as well. And so perhaps your memory is not as great. But it's a very, um, I tried to think, a very tender piece where I see my mother in the past and I see her now and reflect. And this was published in a British magazine. And it's titled, A Small World. My mother and I walk leaf quiet, her hands as delicate as birds, as we pick berries from a blue spot of grass rising with heat in its summer madness of bees. Her garden roses open innocently to the fractured light, to not threaten a butterfly carefully lifting its wings to, perch it, to worship in this temple of imagined seashells sharing whispers in the remaining shade. How alike they are, the butterfly, a boy guarding the open sea, each rose a dying breath sweetly awaiting the darkness, like mother, younger than trees then, and in the moonlight when I dream back, her fingernails move softly as petals. Had I, um, Croatian girlfriend for a while, and Croatia is a beautiful country, it really is. <clears throat> and she had a, um, a nephew by the name of Andre. And this was Andre's, one of Andre's first summer experiences at a barbecue. Hello. So this is titled Andre and it's for Andre. Walking into the spring light and out of the shadows he left behind, to stand by the fire made him a believer in the dark, dark secrets grandma told him he would understand in time. And so he became grandpa's first responder, the little helper who inched his way closer to the rising magic of a barbecue flame, turning black coal as white as sunlight. He masked his face against the smoke with his tiny palm and squeezed his eyes half closed and froze in the burning glare, the way forest animals do, until grandma assured him that the bucket of water grandpa keeps nearby will save them 
and keep them safe, the way his fingers feel in grandma's hand. About a little boy simply who was frightened by the flame of the first barbecue of the summer season. And I've got a, a poem which my good friend Herbert sitting there who um, likes blind, getting on a tram here in Karlsruhe, I got on a tram, and following me on this tram was a couple, um, man and a woman, both blind, and they both had canes. And I sat right behind them, and it was really fascinating, honestly, to just kind of listen in a little bit. I'm a writer, you do these things, you know? You're not supposed to, but you know. If you want information, if you want emotion, if you want passion, you have to. And I just observed. It's titled, Blind. They walked out of the snow with slouched backs into the tram, literally the blind leading the blind, a gentle tapping pointing out their way, and sat down next to each other, their backs tipping over and their canes alongside their outstretched legs. And as they sat finding comfort easily by touch and sound, their distance to other passengers was felt in a calm hunger for knowing where they were, as if their eyelids, like the horizon, understood distance and shape, but could not be pressed further than beyond that end to which their probing hands only reached for each other, not for help, but for play as their bodies enjoyed the movement, enjoyed the expected juggling about, and then laughed, and she came closer to kiss his closed eyes, knowing that darkness does not always erase memories, and that memory is never better than imagination. Um, if you take the S5 tram or the S2, it takes you on your way to uh, Durlach, right? I believe. And <clears throat> if you get off at the Tula Strasse area, there's a, um, I guess it's a Russian church um, on the right-hand side. I don't recall the name of it, but, uh, and I'm not so sure it's a church, but in my poem it is, so you know. <laughs> as, tr as Trump says, alternative facts work, right? <laughs> so. Um, and I was getting off the tram at that spot, and this was in wintertime. <clears throat> and Judy, Julia, hi guys, good to see you. Um, so I get off of the tram, and I see a group of men hovering about. And it was a rather interesting, peculiar scene until I realized what was going on. Can you still hear me okay? Okay, great. This is titled, A Gathering. The night in winter does not roll in lazily. Instead, it bursts over the city like a dark wound spreading quickly. There is a park we pass on the way into the city, near an old Russian church off of Tula Strasse, where old men huddle over a small fire. Their shadows pressed tightly like a clump of trees, listening to the darkness, chanting a prayer lost in the wind only the dying would remember. They are not alone. As black birds like mobsters stalk the snowy field, burying their own shadows into the hard ground. They congregate like rigs on a Texas oil field exploiting the earth with their beaks until the moon is a piece of gold hurtling before them, but they do not fly away. They leap and stretch their necks out as if drunk on cold air. And the men join in by stomping to keep their feet warm and clapping their hands to shake off the chill. This is the dance of the forgotten. They silently migrate and know no difference between day or night. One by one they leave and drift away, 
to the sound of church bells that echo against the darkness. It's a place, I guess, where a lot of homeless people congregate, come together. They light some fires on an open field in order to stay warm in winter. Um, an, interest, an interesting but sad scene, of course. I've got a good friend who lives in Ireland. And um, his father passed away at the age of 92 or 93. And he was a good old Irish gentleman, stove pipe in the evening, shot of whiskey on the rocking chair in front of the fire. Uh, we've all seen this a thousand times in movies, but he lived this, seriously. And I wrote this poem for a friend of mine, Donald, for his father, and it's titled Acceptance. I must tell you a little background information. This man was incredibly dedicated to his wife, who had had Alzheimer's at a very young age and who had died maybe 10 years beforehand. There wasn't a day he did not visit her, her at, the at the cemetery. So, acceptance. His frail body rises and saunters to the sounds of Irish wind over the bog, stumbling at 4 a.m. without a care in the dark, to the bathroom with a thankful, lingering sigh and whiskey mumbling lips still clinging to the last round. He clears his throat as if rehearsing for a final song and returns to the dark hallway and the stale smell of his pipe that guides him to the right room, to where his wife had belonged, to where her outline remains. But it is the unexpected prayers afterwards that breaches the joint bedroom wall and takes even the darkness by surprise. And yet, how alike they are, still, alone, godly patient, for the first single thread of light. I've got a, a few poems that sometimes I write and I represent an inanimate object, a dog, a cat, a bird. Sometimes I try to write a poem, although difficult, how a woman might feel, how a child might feel about the various things that go on. And sometimes I write a poem that is a still life. My work is full of pictures. It's how I represent feelings. The images are extremely important in everything that I write. And sometimes I also write about the land, a farmer, a housewife, someone who looks out into the distance and sees the distance and nothing more. And this is a still life titled, A Painting of a Woman. The land is endless at the edge of the prairie, where the town is small and the church smaller. The muted earthly colors of the mountaintop leans awkwardly into the lap of a quarter moon, which finds her angel-lit face in repose, and moths fluttering on the dried-out empty porch has as her unfinished words perched on her lips, are surprised by the darkness and drift away into the brush strokes of fallen stars and the last breath of light. She leans against the wooden post, mistaken for the lover she once was, holding on to all she has, and listens to the tiny voices of children as crickets break the silence of the vast grassland before her. Alone among the unyielding shadows, her fading yellow and green shawl that she wears is still prettier than the flowers she must have planted around a body of dirt appearing to rise. Another still life, a Monet work. The previous poem I just read was an actual painting. And um, this is titled An Impression. And if you've ever been to Normandy and the coast, 
Uh, you must have seen some old pictures or paintings with a woman dressed in a long gown in summer with a parasol and the light shimmering against her dress looking out into the open sea where sailors on fishing boats are perhaps coming in for the end of their day. An impression. Reduced to a shadowy figure pressed against sunlight like smudges of paint, she is cloaked in white clouds which frame her and wears the changing light in her long dress, hemmed in wild flowers and a flowing scarf, as if a part of the blue sky was windblown around her neck. She searches the horizon while her skin absorbs the scent of the sea, and she turns to her left as Monet had imagined she would. At the edge of a bluff, her silhouette beckons for the white sails adrift to enter her narrow vision, which every sailor hungers for at the end of every journey. Um, back to that young Croatian woman friend of mine. Sitting in Istanbul at a bazaar, <clears throat> she wanted to buy a rug. Of course, I was nominated to do the haggling and the negotiating, um, and she got involved as well. But in a conversation with her based on history and culture, the importance of a rug, I discovered, was really very, very crucially important. It truly meant something to the family. Um, interestingly enough, her mother was Christian, her father Muslim, and she was pretty much in both worlds. So this is titled, Buying a Rug at the Istanbul Bazaar. She never imagined herself sitting on a Turkish carpet in a box of a store of rugs and carpets bunker high, piled to the ceiling, drinking tea and watching the water pipe smoke hover and spy on her every thought. She haggled over the price, though, Buying a rug is not about money. While the picture of her body wrapped in silk and wool, opening at night, mingled with the scent of apple and black tea. From grandmother to mother, their rugs bore witness and covered the wooden floors with warmth on the dark nights of a Balkan winter, as the steamy vapors of black tea were poured into tulip-shaped glasses. From grandmother to mother to daughter, to Turkish tea drunk on rugs reflecting a language of its own in the lives of women born to women, born to the stitched hand woven knots, born to the deep throated bray of donkeys and nomads on the high desert mountains, alive in the melodies of rugs lying flat against the world, singing its prayers and pain. Now she sits in a dark corner, remembering the stories of how her grandmother had walked over the stitched flowers, screaming of color, then kneeling in prayer with the sun rising, awakening the gentle touch of God in her voice. So, true, again, lots of these things are true first and or second hand experiences. Um, a great many, many, many years ago, <clears throat> you know, you meet people and there are happy times, there are sad times, there are complicated, challenging times. And um, I met a young woman. I don't mean to give you sad, sad stories. I can't help it. This is what I experience and encounter. And I felt very bad for her. Her husband was only 23, and, and I understand that I lost a sister at 36 to cancer. And so her husband was dying, and they were basically newlyweds, and they didn't, they didn't know beforehand. And I tried to put myself, which is almost impossible, in her shoes to try to understand what she could possibly feel. And I titled this, The Young Wife. She has lived the last year with the scent of death walking her husband at 23 to the bathroom 
shaving his face, watching him sit on the toilet holding on to flimsy paper as a child holds on to a security blanket, afraid in the dark. Then taking his stooped body wrapped in blue terry cloth back to bed, his frail fingers picking at loose threads with the confused ease of children pulling wilted flowers in a forgotten field. In runs her three-year-old son, searching for his reflection in daddy's colorless eyes. And all the while, from the bedroom's hidden corner, she rubs her own thighs with fingers that sneak away from the dying to vacation on layers of skin only he would have known. And as she takes out his shirt to wear and rub his old sweat against her breasts, she remembers how easy it was to be a wife. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you that I probably went through the order of what I would read maybe 50 or 75 times, literally. Um, I also write about my family. And not to be politically incorrect, but as you all probably know by now, <clears throat> um, the United States through Trump is making it really pretty hard for immigrants to come into the United States. And um, my parents were immigrants. They were um, in the camps of World War II in Germany. They originally came from Poland. And they immigrated to the United States. And of course, their childhood, their youth was taken away. So they didn't have any education. So I guess in, in Trump's world, they wouldn't have been allowed to come to the United States. And I wouldn't be here, perhaps, reading poetry to you today. So there was a friend of mine by the name of Miller Williams, a poet whose name perhaps most of you do not know. And as you saw, I believe, Liz, would you correct me? Maya Angelou gave the reading for Obama's um, inauguration, I believe. And quite often, a president will ask a poet, go figure, huh? Will ask a poet to give a reading at an inauguration. And Miller Williams was the poet who gave the reading for Bill Clinton's inauguration. And Miller was a friend. Um, and he taught me a lesson. He had written a poem a long time ago about his dying father. And he said his father had told him that if the poem was good, his father would, have, would approve. If you write, you have to walk through walls. You have to walk through every risk and every fear possible. And I wrote this. It's a bit long, so bear with me, please. And hopefully you'll follow this journey about my father. When my father was dying, while he was going through this process, I couldn't help but write in my head. And afterwards, I wrote this poem. And it's titled, The Confessions of a Dying Man. Enraptured with the odd angle of oncoming, oncoming death that stiffens his neck and beckons his tongue to slither beyond his dried lips, salted by summer heat, he tells a story as quietly as God allows. Out pours a little mousetrap house from his mouth, towering above his childhood and slanted against Polish streets, carrying horses and buggies in the shadows of farmers and old men, wearing yarmulkes, praying in dark corners, to not be seen. This was his song. This was his rhythm. As much as his eyelids, now shuddering to lift his soul away from the sticky sheets and fleshy smell of long goodbyes. But he is still bent on telling us his story and wets his lips to prepare us. It was a long time coming, this death of his, and he was ashamed to have outlived a child, and literally everyone. But this is true of all fathers. And again, he wet his lips, 
with the thought of sweet grass he will lie under and the coolness of fingers dipped in the water bowl before prayers on Friday evenings when candlelight and rising smoke transfixed his boyhood. His eyes burned and we saw tears. His fingers gripped the bed and we saw discolored knuckles that matched the muted earth where skinless bones had been shoveled out of ovens still warm and tossed across dirt fields, where families and whole towns are buried, and in his chin the landscape still quivers with the mere memory of sisters singing and grandmothers laughing. All this he expressed freely in the bubbled smiles he managed to release with the help of an oxygen tank and morphine needles that offered salvation and hope. A deadly cocktail of holy grail ambitions and wooden crosses leaning against wailing walls, and you could hear the silent cries for help. And we wondered if veins would burst with pain, if muscles contorted the same way, and if the fatty cysts on his arms and legs would stop reminding us of little crazed mice scampering in forgotten mazes, gasping for air. Would they come alive and plead for life? But instead, they seemed to gather and merge in a gulping motion when he tried to swallow water. His narrow eyes projected a dim light too weak to remember, names or faces other than a wife who still baited him with promises of eternity and desperation, and yet he could not resist telling us more, knowing he no longer needed to be the housebroken pet rambling in wet diapers when life was so much easier, being motionless and skinned, scaled and gutted the way his father and mother had been when they were removed from the face of the earth. And so you look closely and wonder how those legs could have carried so much weight. How did those arms not always fall? Or was the sound of laughter different in his head than how others heard it? And were there voices that made him forget himself as if he had never existed, as if nothing had ever existed, as if every voice was the same voice, the same endless moment. There was a grunt, a moan, a second of misunderstood pleasure before a final cleansing that saw his body curl up and nurses panic. And he turned to one side, the last turn, the last breath. The smell of alcohol solution and body odor of waste and dead air and dust piled on window blinds had no meaning. They had no meaning. The darkness could not keep daylight beyond this room from taking hold. He had turned, leaving behind untold stories of when he was young. He had turned only to have a terry bath robe belt latched on like the good soldier's helmet strapped tightly beneath the jaw and chin to keep animal wildness human and caged. This was the greatest act of love he could have given to make us believe he was confessing with every word we had said to ourselves. So, um, <clears throat> let me move on to. Uh, have you ever walked over to a tram station and see the, the tracks and seen a little dead bird? Raise your hands if you have. Come on, some of you must have seen that. Of course. Of course. And I saw this one day. You never have? No? <laughs> okay. I, I noticed and observed this one day. And I write a little, wrote a little piece titled First Morning Tram. And this took place here in Carlsruhe. <laughs> Out of a dark sleep, the tram argues its way around the curve, full of metallic screeching, like vultures' foreplay, 
but it is too late for this little finch, who must have known the speed of things and had measured incorrectly. Perhaps it had misunderstood the new light now that the season is changing. And yet it had been an unexpected moment of its body surrendering to a loss of flight and the quiet turning of feathers spinning away to the sides of the rails, full of the city rumbling in its ears. It lies here as a fist full of color or a rumpled pair of woolen socks, the sort you see lying around sometimes forgotten by small children. And isn't it clear that forever it will carry those endless sounds inside of its stuffed self? I have a friend who um, oh, I've known Sherry for about 40 or 45 years now. Yes, I am really that old, trust me. You should see it from the inside. It's much older. And um, <clears throat> she owned a farm. And her children were very young. And she had a cocker spaniel. So I wrote a poem whose name was Velvet, by the way. And that's, that's true. And I wrote a poem based on what I thought Velvet might be thinking. So here I am, a dog by the name of Velvet. Velvet, a Cocker Spaniel story. Sherry says the kids like to play outside in the countryside of upstate New York, where the occasional criminal is a black bear tossing aside garbage cans, or a deer darting in and out of the wood that surrounds the property. But Velvet always accompanies Deanna and Justin as she rolls in the first dreams of early sunlit mornings, turning green patches of grass where the leaves darken into pools of memory and bone. She runs knowing the land is thick with hills and forest and where its secret hiding places are as Sherry rides the tractor following the sun-sloped curve of dog into black grass of flies splintering to the next spot of stillness as green stretches itself out to change color before the trees. Velvet ignores the machinery sounds and bounces in the shadows of spring swallows feeding on misplaced bugs. Her hollow bark seems endless and full of long pointed wings and dizzy flies. When dusk light approaches and the kids watch the sun set behind the smoky hills and the sun and the sky turns as dark as Velvet's eyes, she sits as a soft wooden moment by Justin and Deanna's side when dogs dream and chase the color of grass. And um, I wrote a poem about my children. I've got two children. They're not little children anymore. And Back upstate in New York, they would um, run across these open fields and there were lots of drain pipes on the ground where water is trickling out and they were looking and searching for frogs. I guess that's what you do as children. You try to find frogs. So this is titled Saving Frogs. In clumps of grass where green struggles against September's wind, my daughter circles to search the thickest part for legs, beady eyes, and humpback skin and follows frog sounds that slurp through a drain pipe ravine. She is saving frogs, she says, parallel dancing, crisscrossing the stream ahead, behind each sound, every air bubble that rises to the surface, holding a glass jar with white rocks and silky water. There are twig poked holes and silver foil paper tops. And when one is caught, she's encircled by other children, panting from the run across fields with sacrificial flies in their fists. Huddled about, they shake as each heartbeat and gulp oozes between her palm and thumb. In the late afternoon, 
kept safe as a trophy in glass and forgotten on a porch for hours. Only marigolds now full of twilight survive the heat. At night she creeps barefoot and alone in the dark, stares at the frog's black purple seed eyes, lifts the jar like a test tube as if expecting something to grow. I guess little children have no idea that if you put a frog in a glass jar and cover it with a little foil paper and poke some holes in it, that it's not going to really live very long. And at night, she went back to check. She creeped in the darkness to go back and check. And she was shocked. Why is the frog not alive? Lessons learned, right? Okay, so, um, as I said, sometimes you can, and we'll take a break in a little bit, right? Okay. Um, sometimes you just make an observation. And I was walking by a cafe and I saw this old man who I had a feeling might be homeless. And he was, um, I think, having a cup of coffee. And he was sitting at an outdoor cafe. And you know, in Germany and perhaps in other European countries, if you walk into a bakery cafe and you see the counter, and it's summertime, full of bees, right? OK? And you, this doesn't happen in the United States. I mean, that just doesn't work that way. So you, you look into the counter, and there are a ton of bees. And I would never work in there, put my hands in that. It's not my thing. Um, you've all seen this, right? And I, I got this feeling looking at this old guy and then looking at the bees in the counter, and I came up with something titled Sidewalk Bakery. The milky air of summer swarms with bees that carry them to a glass counter. Full of warm bread and cakes, they swirl over, rumbling their bodies against glass and synonym mired in the honey and raisins they mount and thread as if sky or a lost cloud they marvel at, threatening the daylight with a different blackness unlike their own, fluttering among the glazed tops of sweetened dough, and it is a bond they can return to, a crazy love of sunlight that stings against glass aimlessly, as lovers often do. But they are not alone. For the old poor man who sits outside at a wobbly table with coffee and cigarette in hand, a shaking hand, smells the honey and warm bread, stares at the counter with what can only be sexual desire, some hidden jealousy of bees he imagines he could have been. Shall we stop? OK, we're going to stop at this point in time. Uh, there was supposed to be someone here with um, some food and coffee and blah, blah, blah. And obviously, they are not here. I apologize for that. Or are they here? You are here? Great, ladies. Thank you. I'm sorry. I did not know. Is it set up somewhere else? Oh, it's set up in the back. Oh, OK. Great. I apologize for that. I didn't realize. Anyway, so let's go ahead and take a break. Please, thank you. Please help yourself to uh, to whatever is out there. And ladies, again, Sophia, Anna, is she here? No. Okay. Um, please help yourself. And if you're interested in checking out any books, they're over here. And we'll be back in just a little bit. Thank you.
Okay, so. Poetry, first floor. Novels, third floor. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you for that, Alex. I like that. I should get that at my apartment. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so thank you for, um, for making the time and coming out. I, I really do appreciate it. Even though a teacher asks you to attend, I mean, let's face it, you know, um, students do what they feel they need to do. So <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of you, uh, teachers, friends, students, for having come out this evening. It's, uh, it's very much appreciated. It really is. So I'm going to read um, a few more poems, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. <clears throat> and again, I sometimes take on the voice of, um, of an individual who perhaps cannot voice certain things. <clears throat> this is titled for, it's titled Born Again, and it's pretty much um, uh, takes me back to and I don't really truly know why, but it takes me back to the land, uh, farms, mountains, such as the Midwest of the United States, as an example. And I envisioned what a young woman who might feel that <clears throat> she is caught up in a particular lifestyle, in a particular environment that she doesn't want to be a part of, but doesn't truly have a choice. Again, titled, Born Again. She is born on the way to the hospital in the back seat of her father's car, her first breaths inhaling the lingering stench of cigarettes and whiskey, and the crumpled newspaper ads usually tossed onto the back seat that her mother's fingers grab tightly onto as the black print takes hold while her mother screams into the corners of an old Chevy's dark red torn leather. The car races alongside the old tracks that cross Route 81 and had at one time been a part of a cattle trail on the edge of the prairie and hasn't lost the smell of beef and oils stinking up the Great Plains. The snow makes the car skid across the buried wheat, suffering its long silence any Baptist or old Indian would understand as they pass a dried out creek darkened by the outline of the imagination of trees lost in the patchwork of everything else, flat against a crystal sky, carrying only the sounds of an owl hooting and wood smoke. In the long winter, land stretches out into barren fields full of nothing but flat, hard dirt where nothing grows in the cold emptiness, not corn, not flowers, not love, nothing, as if the mountains in the distance don't really exist other than as a burden on the land. How much bigger everything is, bigger than her, and the way light collects darkness, hurling it down at her, at the farmhouse she lives in, as if no one exists, where every day will be a reminder that life ends here, that she is lost among the blackness that fills her world, makes her small, makes her dreams small. She will be different, though different from the loneliness you get used to on a farm. She will be more than the dust and rows of wheat and learn to see her parents like hungry animals in the shadows when as everything else in darkness, a different truth rises. She will become a woman and look out at the prairie and feel the vibration of wolves rather than her father's screams. How often she will wonder about the footprints of rabbits she rarely sees or of the tiny lives moving freely under the short grass. How good it will feel to see the newborn colors of wildflowers giving hope to the dry earth. How much 
she will long for that kind of intimacy. So, back to Ireland. I've been to Ireland many, many, many times. <clears throat> and it's a lovely country. For those who haven't visited Ireland, you really must go. Now, go now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a lovely country with tons of open people who you can easily and comfortably speak to, interact well with, share a joke, share a moment. Um, a personal story, the last time I was in Ireland was December and January last year and the early part of this. And I was traveling on the wild Atlantic coast. <clears throat> and I stopped off in a, um, in a small town. I had to go to the bathroom. And I went into the bathroom, and there's another guy in the bathroom. And it reminded me of one of those sex in the city or, or uh, one of those comedy routines. And I'm doing my thing, and he's doing his thing. And he turns to, to the side, and he goes, are you new? And I wasn't sure where to look at that point. <laughs> I said, uh-huh. So what do you think of this town? I go, pretty nice. And you? Are you from here? He goes, no. My mother-in-law and my father-in-law gave my wife and I a present, staying over at a nice hotel near the coast. And we're both doing our thing and having this conversation. I, I felt like I had joined, you know, a, a, a book club for the month. And, but it was a lovely experience. And the whole point is that communication and interaction in Ireland is a lovely experience, and one that you should really see and, and share for yourselves. However, this is my picture of Ireland. <clears throat> All day, the salty air flutters like wings shedding light across the flat, bristled land, the scrubby mounds so green they turn black. A skulking fox, matted fur, damp in the Irish wind, where once bears snouted their way across the grassy knolls. Shadows find shelter in a creviced slope that curves towards the sea as the, slut, as the sun slips behind a jagged cliff where a dirt road ends in darkness. The marshes turn blue as the last wave rushes ashore. What secrets lie tucked beneath ancient stones? What hidden footprint tells a forgotten story? Whose bones lie buried under the shallow pools and how many frozen breaths protect the first flowers of spring. Ireland. You can't go wrong going to Ireland. <clears throat> and you get all the beer you can possibly imagine. <clears throat> True experience many, many, many years ago when I was a child, back up again in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, there was a large pool, and I went swimming in this large pool with my sister. And I witnessed something that was rather scary, because she was basically drowning. And this is titled, Pool. Trauma creates its habits. Old comfort zones we come to rely on. And so the day my sister almost died, I was hypnotized and shaking wet as water sloshed about against the sides of the swimming pool that had seen her body fished out by someone else's father. One minute she had been a lily pad shimmering white over something glossy and perfect, and the next moment found her back scaled and her bony filling with air making her ribs ride a wave that ran inside of her. And I thought it was a miracle, the kind we dream of, and that heaven was still water and dragonflies gently landing in fluttering pockets of sunlight. My sister had known everything then, what it was like to be afraid and need love, 
and I was jealous of the near death I had missed out on, being only a bystander, watching air bubbles become gray pearls popping out of her mouth as her black hair swept over her like darkness draping a coffin. I sat by her, listening to the wind as her angry body changed into forgiveness. I had always known mother loved her best. <clears throat> back, back to the young lady from Croatia. I keep coming back to that. And that's because <clears throat> when you know people or you share time with people, you write poems. Well, a poet does anyway. And um, she had gotten sick at one point in time. And she was here in one of the hospitals <clears throat> because she had, um, well, I don't want to make it too personal, but she had discovered a lump. And we know how that works. And she was at a certain station in the hospital, and the station was um, numbered M8. So this is titled Station M8. Even from the waiting room, where medicinal air filters throughout, the windows buckle at the sounds of helicopter blades sauntering between buildings, forcing trees, tree leaves to rain under the dry cement patio at the hospital entrance. We wait on a three-seated black couch rife with arterial tributaries showing age in their white scarred lines as nurses scurry by with fixed smiles and pockets bulging of cell phones. Other patients return like unwanted mail delivered to their rooms. When we last see her under a thick white blanket rolled on a bed in and out of hallway shadows towards the elevator, departing like so many departures. We have come to know we're waiting in line or on planes as bridemaids and dead men walking or the unemployed who fear the anticipation and expectations of the unknown. <clears throat> and back to the same person, that was the station she was at, but she was also in a room. And the room was 229. So this is titled Room 229. She returns from surgery, not knowing that fear would smell like leftover food and rubbing alcohol vapors would seep out the window left ajar to almost purify the heavy air or that a washcloth could provoke such tenderness as to return color to her pale face, the way dusk light for a moment illuminates everything that rises from the earth. And back again to the Midwest, an old story. <clears throat> back in the early days, the 1800s of the Midwest, there were very few people. But today, <laughs> today I had a, a class at the Dual Hochschule, and I showed them a map of the United States, and I asked them, where do you think you can find Germany on this map? And they didn't know. So I said, take a good look. The state of Montana, with less than one million people, would accommodate and house all of Germany with a little over 82 million people. Not very many people. Very sparse. And if you ever watched an old Western movie or TV show, you would hear <clears throat> that the neighbor, well, the neighbor's not far. The neighbor's only 20 miles away. But 20 miles away in the 1880s would take you a long time to get there. So we go back to the Midwest, back to the 1800s, back to disease and back to the hardships of living on the land. This is titled Three Graves. The ranch house roof, weighed down by snow drifts, peeked out from the shelter of forest shadows, surrounding a frozen meadow. Footprints leading from the house to three small brown wooden crosses tied with horsehair 
was the only color alive for as far as your eyes could see. In the corral to the side of the house stood Betsy, an old mare who leaned against the aged timber wagging its tail in the clouded air. The shovel old Jim had used to bury the children remained straight up in the snow, leaving its thin shadow to hold any warmth possible in the late winter of 73, when smallpox spread from family to family. They say his wife walked out of the house the night the last child died, walked straight into the darkness, through the snow, and into the high hills. She was naked and bloodied and passed the graves singing lullabies, prancing, and then running into the barren timber never to be heard of or seen again. When a neighbor who had trekked three miles in glassy sunlight on snowshoes made of cow guts and saddle rope and sawed off fire logs to see if old Jim was still alive, he found the house burned down, Betsy gone, and a different toy for each child sitting in front of each grave. He found Jim swinging from a deadened tree out back, whose limbs almost reached the ground with his long body swaying freely. The neighbor said, as the story goes, that Jim swaying was the only sign of life he could feel. Other than that, there was only silence, except for the wind passing, as if voices singing lullabies. <clears throat> you, you heard me read about my father. He died of Alzheimer's. <clears throat> and it's a disgusting disease. And I wrote these two poems about what it might have been like from both his perspective and from mine. <clears throat> and this is titled, Between the Lost and the Forgotten. The night comes and someone always goes with it. As he shuffles by dressed in only a diaper, unsure of where the bedroom is. His hands know the music of small things as he walks almost enchantingly on a pure white floor full of a wife's discipline. He travels in circles thinking that his is a little death the dark will not grieve over and tightens his face as insects do to unknown sound. He does not belong to the silence yet and goes on imagining where a straight line can take him. <clears throat> and this next piece, again about that same topic, titled, The Stranger at 3 AM, A Father with Alzheimer's. I know that it is you, because I can smell your age behind the closed door and hear your shuffling feet go back and forth between our bedrooms, a distance you cannot measure in the dark. And so you stand there, gasping for the slender light that reaches you from under my door. And we both knew you came to tell me you were dying again, that you were living out someone else's life, that you were greedy for every last drop of light, that you were too afraid to feel safe, and that in not knowing what to do, you knew to stand there, softly, breathing against the wood, practicing to be noticed. <clears throat> I had mentioned that um, my parents were in the Holocaust. <clears throat> I don't say that easily, you know. Um, and this is true. <clears throat> my mother had told me that back in 1939, um, SS had come to the house and that her little sister, uh, they all died by the way, that her little sister 
had told my parents and my mother to go into the, into the cellar where there were sacks of potatoes and to hide, and that she would take care of this. This is titled, The Things That Little Children Can Do. For a six-year-old to understand death calmly did not surprise her older sister, who shook her head and softly croaked out to her mother and younger brother that German soldiers were approaching again. The younger girl whispered for them to hide in the cellar, behind the sacks of potatoes in cold storage, and to not open the door, no matter what. She closed the front door behind her and turned towards the naked body on the opposite side of the lawn, appearing as a white lump of dead grass gathered and left in the rain. It was not a surprise, for everyone knew he was sick, mad, and no loss to Germans on the hunt. And it was expected he would share death with his neighbors that way. She almost hummed along as she heard the boots approaching noticed the sunlight on them and did not move, not even when the recoil of a bullet leaving a gun found its way into the chest of the dead neighbor, forcing his shoulders to tremble the way her lips did as she clamored, no Jews here. Back to my grandmother. This is what it was like. My, my parents came to the United States on a ship that was sinking. The entire time it crossed the Atlantic, the boat was sinking, literally. And my grandmother, who was my step-grandmother, <clears throat> um, came along also. And we refer to her as Booby, which is the name for grandmother. And this is kind of what I felt. Um, getting to know my step-grandmother as a little boy. My booby smells of worn, torn apples, excuse me, my booby, booby smells of war-torn Europe and cooked apples, thin-lipped and soldier sure, her puffed face and dotted eyes hover over boiling pots of water and peeled carrots. Shadows of war cling to her like skin and she sits by the small wooden kitchen table, smiling out the names of brothers and sisters. She smells of smoldering ash and brown sugar. And I climb her like a fallen tree, some limp pile of wood, listening to whispers to the voices that bleed from her. My booby smells of chicken soup and fresh apricots. She is my first dinosaur plaything, pet person, afraid of the dark, run to, hide to, all is forgiven place when I need to be somewhere safe in the corners of her. Nine years earlier, a metal figurehead on the bow of a ship entering New York Harbor, she stood alone with a taste of salt water and death in her mouth. She became all spidery and quiet. With each visit, she would smile with shiny marble eyes, push $20 into my hands, walk away back to the wooden kitchen table etched with squiggly lines, brown and silver smudges, like a war map of Europe, and sit down, waiting. And fast forwarding regarding my grandmother, <clears throat> We, um, there's a DACA program in the United States and often these young people are referred to as dreamers, having come to the States as very, very young children and the United States, it's the only home that they actually know. And my grandmother had lived on a farm as many Europeans did in the 20s and early 30s of course. And this is looking both back and in the present, and it's titled Dreamer. She had come from the war-torn war streets of Europe where the rubble contained the last images of the dead. 
In the little village near Krakow, she had played with chickens and fed the hogs and watched the sun roll down the water of a shallow pond near her shack in the early evenings, reflect the dreamy descent of cranes and herons floating in a downward arc. Sixty years later, she remembers their accidental steps on legs unprepared to carry their weight and tiptoe with each bony stride the way she does now, as if she carries our lives on her back. She stands alone against the onslaught of clouds in the narrowing dusk light as her stooped body and rubbery face holds firm while her squinted eyes measure out the space on the line with clothespins she holds so gently. One pin is in her mouth as our laundry hangs and dries in the wind of our backyard. It is a ritual of sorts, her treading ever so carefully to not walk over the white sheets and our shirts draping over her thick arms and skirting the tall, uncut grass. How proud she is of those angels swaying in the wind with such grace. Herbert, OK. Yeah, uh, in, in the Seychelles, there is, um, there's a statue with angels dying. Oh, really? But there's no angels. So. OK. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read, um, I haven't ever read this before. And have any of you been to Paris? Great. Of, of those of you who have been to Paris, do you like Paris? Too dirty, too loud, too noisy, right? It's amazing. It's a either it's one or the other. There's never an in-between regarding a city like Paris. <clears throat> one of the last times I was there, I saw an immigrant family living on the street, tucked away in the shadows their bodies against some, a stone building, and the rumbling of the metro under their feet underground. <coughs> and I just couldn't help but write. It, it got to me. And so I wrote this, and it's the first time I've ever read this. This is titled, The Color of History Will Break Your Heart. Their voices are parched from the night air, from prayer and the quiet begging and wailing heaved all day on the streets of Paris, as the night finds them knotted and bundled asleep, set back from the street corner under a lamppost that captures a little child's wide open eyes counting moths flying free and unafraid in the warm light. A family of lumpy shadows, almost ready to be measured for freshly dug graves, they use the darkness to cover their bodies and keep them safe. It is a moment unlike any other. <coughs> As they are not used to, not dreaming, having reached their final destination, against the cold granite headstones of Paris buildings, and yet there is a familiarity shared in the hopelessness and emptiness of that little child's face. That little child's face who had to walk over mass graves that disappeared in the dry earth and then shudder to the sounds of crashing waves against the brittle wood of a ship leaning heavy to its side and full of people clinging to the thought that at least water does not bring pain and cleanses the soul so that God can forgive them for their sins. But here, wedged up against the towering world they had dreamed of, and no longer wooed by the throaty sounds of burrows in the cold desert air, when they first told stories of freedom around the night fires, they have come to accept an ancient fate that dark voices tell them is theirs to keep theirs to own, 
voices emanating from the chip stone of buildings they use for shelter, stones rumbling with more than the sounds of their own hunger or the thundering iron and steel that penetrates the earth under their feet. It is a dark destiny for a little child who ought to be smiling, but who instead finds herself resting upon the wandering souls, stone deep in a labyrinth they cannot escape, as she cannot escape, for she understands the secret of the dying and of sand and water and concrete. She knows there is no adventure other than the warm light of moths flying free. A poem about myself. And it is a poem that shows you the evolution of aging. Don't laugh. It will come your way eventually. <laughs> what goes around comes around. <clears throat> and it really is true. This is the kind of thing that happens. And the poem is meant to be funny, but hopefully it says some things also. And it's titled, It Started This Way. One day I walked out of the house thinking that everything was fine and kept walking until about 15 minutes later, I stopped suddenly and pondered, did I or did I not lock the door? I searched my brain, rummaging over the things I had done, the late breakfast, the long bath, the sitcom I promised myself I would not watch, the last poem written, and as hard as I tried, I could not remember if I had locked the front door. I could not hear the turning of the key in my head. I could not feel the memory of my hand shaped around the middle, and I could not see myself living what I had just lived, as if I had witnessed a crime my brain was protecting me from. Panic set in and I ran home, afraid to find some strange man sitting in my house robe, writing my poems, drinking my coffee, even looking better than me with a smile on his face that said, I told you so, having known all along that this would happen. It had happened before, with a window left open in the bedroom, with a wallet I had thought was in my back pocket, with the bill I had gone into town to pay, surprised to find it was not in my backpack, as the young serviceman smiling, shaking his head when I told him I would run home and return in just a bit. New girlfriends ask about old lovers, and there is never much to say. There is no memory of their faces in the mornings, or how they felt in the darkness, or sometimes even of their birthdays or what it had been like to travel to South Africa and walk among monkeys, or New Zealand walking on a glacier, or standing beside a sphinx in Egypt, or anywhere for that matter. In time, what you remember is what you want to forget. How a father lies deadly still as an actor having forgotten the lines. And you hope the memory of the birth of a child can outlast the loss the emptiness you used to feel trying to recall the title of a film, the name of an actor, the character in a novel, the way it had felt to first fall in love, the first night you understood the tenderness of a woman, or how to make a really great sandwich at 3 a.m., hoping the neighbors would forget the noises you made giggling and crying and moaning, almost praying the walls pretending you were never there. How the sounds of bathwater bubble in the steam. Remembering how words find their way onto paper and hoping that paper can remember the sounds of a pen recalling what you seem to forget. Alzheimer's. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read one last poem, but it, it's a long piece. It's titled Family Diary, written a long time ago. <clears throat> the dates are real. 
and we'll end with this, okay? <clears throat> um, it's about a family of a couple of generations worth and living on the farm starting during the, well, before and during and somewhat after the Depression. Life was not easy. And this is written in different sections. Family Diary, The Farm, 1919, Part 1. Sunday night, March the 9th. The low light makes it hard to write these words, and the swell of wind across the prairie keeps thumping against the windows that I can hardly think, but I can hear him beneath me as Papa shuffles from room to room so that I can almost hum a song to his rhythm and picture his swollen hands, those same hands that had just gently prepared sandwiches and hot tea with whiskey for Mama as she sat on her chair rocking herself to sleep beside the fire. And I would watch him take his night stiffness and cover Mama with a blanket blowing out kitchen candles, leaving the last part of him on frozen windows. I hear the shuffling in my sleep and hum tunes into my pillow to the spitting of rusted wagon wheel spokes. Papa would forever be mending crooked nails in dry wood and buildings leaning as trees into wind that carries my grandfather's laughter my little sister Jen's high voice, the howling of wolves. Family Diary, The Farm, 1919, Part 2. Tuesday night, March the 25th. The tall grass and wild flowers whisper at night, and the quiet purr of wind-swept Minnesota with rain shines in the moonlight, competing with grandfather's warm knees Little Jen sits on, learning to count by buttoning and unbuttoning his shirt. And Mama's quiet gestures along Jen's hair where sadness takes hold in the bristles of a brush. And with each stroke, the blinding white light on nearby headstones against our windows become stars in a black sky. Family Diary, The Farm. 1919, Part 3, Thursday morning, April the 17th. The cold sun dances on the ground, and I hear grunts, and know it is Father who does not just work the land. He loves the land, bleeds in sweat and dirt, and the rows of wheat, corn, in the cold, the heat, and the stench of animal manure, and vomit from hunger and worry, and only stops to drink water or tell us stories of when he was a child and grandfather fought prairie fires, hail, drought, and grasshoppers, clouds upon clouds of fluttering wings, turning the earth dark, leaving a forest of yellow stalks that in their nakedness made grandfather feel naked too. And then the struggling of plow and horse, cutting through, turning over, and lifting the dirt as my father leaves me standing with the wind behind my back, moving farther away to where the hard prairie remains untouched. Family Diary, The Farm, 1919, Part 4. Sunday morning, May the 4th. My sister skips through a field of flowers near a stream that snakes its way across our farm, and she finds herself in the middle of a swarm of bees disturbed and hungry for her to stop screaming. But she runs until grandfather covers her with a blanket and then with vinegar to ease the pain and sits up all night to see if she will die. She lives, but grandfather is stung too. And days later, thin and unable to speak, he walks into the woods slowly with bucket in hand, pretending to pick berries, instead searching for the right spot to die. Family Diary, The Farm, 1919, Part 5, Monday morning, May the 5th. 
we find grandfather sprawled among dead leaves and fallen tree limbs, his bucket still in hand, and bring him to the family cemetery next to grandma as Jen plants flowers and mama watches from the window, perhaps knowing that only days later she will join grandfather on the day father will cry, staining the wooden casket he sands down with oil that mother will lie in, and baby Jen will sit on the rocking chair alone beside the fire, humming herself to sleep. Family Diary, The Farm, 1931, Part 1, Saturday evening, June the 13th. I have always wondered and dreamed of cities, not far from death, short walk, where perhaps life was more than too little or too much rain. But as a young man where my manhood was measured against the height of corn, the light of day, the unspoken word, in the fields with horse and plow, buckets of water every hundred yards, feeling the horse rain leather age in my hands. I saw my father trying to outrun the dust bowl clouds that lifted his shadow against the dry earth until he decided to lay beside my mother and grandfather in the quiet of family gatherings. Family Diary, The Farm, 1931, Part 2, Sunday morning, July the 4th. On Sunday morning, kneeling against tombstones, Jen and I pull weeds from among the rocks, where mother and father and grandfather lie, among the line shadows feathered by butterfly dust and spiders. I watch Jen lose color in her cheeks from the long days and nights, sitting on mother's rocking chair with mother's blanket in one hand, tea and whiskey in the other, humming to the movement of dust, the summer swirls of sand, and her babies play with mice and rag dolls made of wood and cotton. Family Diary, The Farm, 1932, Part 1, Tuesday, September the 20th. The house smells of lamp oil and wild roses that grow beside weathered wood, and I hear my father's dirt-dried voice and smell tobacco on the pages of the same books that he read to me. I now read to my son, sitting on my lap, stories of farms, corn, grasshoppers, the wild prairie, and with each turn of the page I see my father's pipe sliding from corner to corner and feel his touch, taste the earth, Breathe in leather and lamp oil and the sweet lilac smells of mother's hair and the oven bread aroma on her cheeks in the morning. Family Diary, The Farm, 1939, Part 1, Friday night, December the 22nd. When I close my eyes and think of home, I hear the prairie sing and pull me to the howling of wolves. Baby Jen's cry in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. The dust clouds and the earth wet with only my father's sweat and my mother's sweet humming in a rocking chair now kept safe among the ruins. They are all gone now. Father, mother, grandfather, and baby Jen. I feel them within me, always. As my shovel turns the earth, their hands on mine and the gentle swaying of rocking chair wind against my face. If you were to dig deep into my pockets, I wish you could pull out the sweet smell of home. If only in my head stars did not burn the, with the light of tombstones and the prairie refused to whisper at night. Thank you very much. So.
nothing like destroying everything at the end. <laughs> anyway, once again, I'd like to thank all of you very, very, very much for having come out. Um, I certainly appreciate it. And something I'd like to share with you, and that is, at the end of the day, when an age has passed, how do we know what took place? In the films we watch, in the history books that are written, and in the poems that have recorded what we did and what we didn't do. Read and enjoy. Thanks again and have a good night.